Welcome to Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. Who or what is the trickster? Why is the concept present in virtually every culture? Is the trickster good or bad? Well, hello there, and welcome to the 437th edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno. I'm Paul, and filling in for Ben this evening is our good friend Rosemary Ellen Guiley, prolific author, well-known speaker, and uh, paranormal renaissance woman, as we always call her. Rosemary, welcome back to the show. Hi there, Paul. It's great to be substituting for Ben, although I'm going to miss him on the show. Well, I miss him too, but he's, you know, he's uh, slogging back and forth to Boston to school until the end of the semester, so... Uh, there we are. But anyway, today is, of, of course, the 1st of April, known as April Fool's Day or All Fool's Day. The origins of this tradition are uncertain, but in Europe it used to be a day when people were kind, uh, I guess, kind of kind to the village idiot. Now it's essentially a fun spring fever kind of thing when people play tricks on each other. Uh, accordingly, we thought it very appropriate to dedicate this show to what is known in folklore around the world and in the paranormal as the trickster. April Fool's, just kidding. Actually, we're going to talk about haunted jello molds. <clears throat> no, just kidding, anyway. Uh, Rosemary, how would you, um, am, I, am I giving a sort of a complete description of April Fool's Day, or is there more to it? Uh, well, it's become that, that we, we just play tricks on each other today. Um, actually, you know, the whole day has gone by, and I haven't even thought about playing a trick on someone or having a trick played on me. Well, you should have seen the weather here. That was tricks, tricksy enough, I guess. But uh, yeah, it, we had the. It was in the 60s this afternoon, and now we're headed for the wind chills in the teens. Right? So, anyway, but in any case, um, how would you define the trickster? The, tri- the trickster is a god or a spirit. Uh, can be a person or one of these hybrids, like a, a human animal hybrid. We find these figures in mythology around the world, and they're sly. They're cunning and deceitful, they play tricks, uh, but they have a good side to them, too. They bring culture, they teach people, uh, sometimes even after they've taken advantage of people, uh, they leave something good behind. Sometimes they're malicious, like uh, Loki of, of Norse mythology, sometimes they're more playful, like um, a clown, but these figures exist in mythology, and they're rule breakers. That's essentially it. They break the rules of convention, of what's considered to be acceptable, the rules of nature, and they get away with it. Interesting. Now, I know that when we communicated before, uh, in the, the weeks before the show here, uh, you, you sent some notes that are very interesting because the trickster abounds, as you say, in the paranormal, certainly in ufology. Uh, and you mentioned, and I, and it's sort of cartoonish in a way, uh, Men in Black, Spring Heeled Jack, who was this interesting fellow in London some years ago, uh, the Hopkinsville entities that we've done whole shows on with Geraldine Sutton Stith, who's the daughter of uh, one of the people who experienced that, uh, weird creatures, the gin, and a lot of strange poltergeist stuff. What have you run into when it comes to the trickster in your own work? And you, you've been at this uh, quite a few years. I run into the trickster all the time, and there are cases of anything, a haunting, a, a mysterious creature sighting, a lot of these UFO cases uh, where things don't make sense. And they're often terrifying to people, but the appearances of the entities or the circumstances surrounding them have almost a comical sort of quality to them. It's as though all the rules get turned upside down. And uh, in the process, you just kind of left rather dizzy as to, as to what actually was experienced. In, in the case of those Hopkinsville entities, uh, they look clownish, uh, and they acted clownish, and bullets went through them, mm. uh, and they defied the laws of gravity, and, and they acted more like pranksters. But the, the family involved was absolutely terrified of them because they had this bizarre appearance. They looked like weird little elves. Yeah, with the, the large ears, Geraldine des- described them in detail, and she's written a book about it, and it's well known in the, the uh, lore of the paranormal. And that was in, in Kentucky. Was it, correct me if I'm wrong, was it 1955? Uh, yes, it was. Okay. And uh, th- these very strange whitish figures that would, ha- were it not for the size of their ears, 
uh, looked uh, from what the way they're described to me, almost like the, the classic grays that we hear about in UFO cases and abduction cases. But they had these, and almost like giant mice or something, and they came and they they they'd, uh, fire it with them at them with shotguns, and they wouldn't have any effect. Maybe they'd knock them down, but they'd get right up again, and uh, this sort of thing. So I see what you mean. Well, in in the paranormal, uh, the trickster is a little different than in mythology where a trickster can be like a helping figure or a teaching figure. In the paranormal, trickster manifests as something that just plain doesn't make sense and you don't know whether to scream in terror or laugh in hysterics or do both. Mm -hmm. And oftentimes you wind up with no good explanation for it. It's like, what the heck was that all about? (laughs) I get that every day. Uh (laughs) <laughs> now, now Ben has actually researched this in uh, with the Navajo people in the Southwest, uh, particularly in uh, Arizona, and the the association with animals. I always found very interesting. Now, it seems on on the face of it, and of course, every uh, folklorist will tell you, or student of folklore will tell you that all these stories are there for a reason. They're based on some sort of concept or archetype or something that was or, or something that actually happened at some point and then perhaps probably was embellished and everything else in ways that we can understand and so the association with with coyote and with the rabbit and animals that have to live by their wits seems to be relatively obvious but Ben was talking about the association even with the skinwalkers yes and many of them uh, are considered to be evil uh, the, the term skinwalker technically is applied to sorcerers who go go out at night and uh, do evil deeds, and uh, people have been terrified of them, of course, and you, you dare not go on into their areas where they were known to frequent and travel. It's also been applied more loosely to uh, shape-shifting entities uh, who may appear as humans or as human-animal hybrids, um, things that we don't really know what they are, but they also act in uh, scary and, and malevolent ways. Um, one trickster figure is, I think, a form of jinn, and that's the shadow man or the shadow person. Oh, jinn is a, essentially an Arabic term, am I right? Yes, it means the hidden ones, and it right. applies to a supernatural, uh, supernaturally powered race of beings uh, who have tremendous powers to take on any shape they want. And we would equate them with demonic kinds of entities in our culture, uh, the ones that interact with us are often hostile, uh, and they will play tricks. Uh, they will do poltergeist things like steal things uh, and uh, then return them to odd places. That's very trickster. A lot of kinds of entities do that. But one of the favorite forms of the jinn is this shadow person, which is a solid black silhouette, usually visits people in their bedrooms at night, and you can't see any features on it. It looks like a tall man wearing a a coat or a cape, and often a hat. And this figure is absolutely terrifying. It just radiates this hostility and malevolence, but it's got some crazy hat on. And the hats can be anything from like a detective hat, like a Dick Tracy kind of hat, uh, to uh, an Abraham Lincoln style, you know, the Victorian uh, era stovepipe hat, uh, big um, floppy fedoras, cowboy hats. Uh, and you have to ask, why would an entity bent on doing something tech, perhaps uh, harmful to people, why would it show up wearing a crazy hat? And that's, it's the incongruity of it. Uh, we, we find these things over and over again in the paranormal. There's uh, an entity that I've been researching in West Virginian lore called uh, the Grave Robber, and it's... Uh, a phantom-like creature that has the body of something that looks like a a miniature armadillo uh, combined with an alligator snout, pig's feet with claws, and a ridge of uh, spines on its back like a triceratops. I never heard of that. And um, they're reported in the the lore of Kentucky and West Virginia and uh, kind of that area down there in the Mid-South. Uh, and ha- likes to hang around cemeteries. But here again, we have this crazy appearance that, once again, you don't know whether to be amused by it or to be frightened of it. And so one of the questions that paranormal researchers and ufologists 
uh, have had for decades is why? Why do these beings show up in such odd appearances? Is it them? Is it how we perceive them? Is that the only way? Are they trying to mess around with our minds by um, turning everything upside down? We don't really have any good answers. Well, I've often wondered that my, <clears throat> excuse me, myself, because you know, I run into the same kinds of odd things all the time. <clears throat> and But before we even address that, maybe the issue of where do you draw the line or do you draw the line between the trickster motif in the human consciousness and, uh, you know, garden variety paranormal events, if there, is, if there are such things. Uh, <clears throat> yeah, I'm thinking of um, the house in Bridgeport, Connecticut. You're familiar with that case, 1974, when I was in there. and Mm-hmm. With uh, Ed Lorraine Warren and uh, all the stuff was going on, and there were plenty of uh, tricks being played, but it was very, very serious at the time. I was a seminary student, and I was uh, basing, uh, and so were the Warrens, basing the ideas on on the theological concepts, which I since have have changed substantially. But uh, we thought that was a demonic activity, and it just didn't seem very funny at all. But it, nevertheless, that 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 sense of the trickster was there. Um, where do we draw the line? Suppose you know you're in a sort of a, ha- a haunting situation, or you've got a UFO, you know, uh, like the guys you know climbing up your steps, knocking on the door. Hey, come on, be abducted with it. You know, how, where do you draw the line, or do you? I, I don't think you really can, Paul. I think uh, all of these cases they're uh, they're very blurry in how they can be defined and categorized. There's no neat definitions, no neat boundaries. Uh, there's a whole shape-shifting uh, tone to the paranormal. And when I say the paranormal, I'm including ufology and cryptozoology as well. Uh, there, there's a whole uh, ambiguous uh, liminality to it. It's like these things sort of exist not completely here, not completely there. Wherever there is, it's sort of in between. And so sometimes we don't even know exactly what's going on, what kind of entity we're dealing with. Uh, they seem to shape shift almost as we, we think of them. Uh, and so we have to take the phenomena seriously, uh, and try and make some sort of, um, significance or put things into context regarding the, uh, the clownishness, the incongruity of things. Uh, take for, for example, uh, some of these intense haunting cases. I worked on one for three years in upstate New York which really involved some unpleasant entities, and one in particular that, that uh, got, to be, got to be quite aggressive and nasty. And yet some of the phenomena was like you just almost had to, to just break down into laughter. Uh, you would do poltergeist things like steal objects and return them in weird places. It took the husband's glasses and then stuck them up in a tree. Um, the smoke alarms that went off all the time, uh, even after they were disconnected and the batteries were taken out. <laughs> yeah. uh, strange things like that, just like the whole purpose was just to yank somebody's chain mm. for the sake of doing it. And why do entities do this? Uh, perhaps we're their entertainment. Well, th- that, that's been suggested. Uh, although one of the things that I, in my personal opinion, that, that I point out and have done on the show several times is that I'm not sure it's always entities doing these things because inevitably people will come, and you know too, people will come to us with cases and they'll say, well, you know, first of all, am I crazy? You know, that's question number one, nine times out of ten for us. And people will say, well, well, I put my car keys down and they disappeared or this happened and you know, then it got worse and all, and then they started throwing my, playing frisbee with my fine china and all this. Well, I often wonder, you know, is it, and even in that Bridgeport house where, which was the second worst poltergeist case that I ever dealt with, is it really entities deliberately doing these things? And it could very well be. Most people believe that, that it is. But I often wonder that the, the conditions that are present that allow these things to manifest at all might have byproducts in, in, this, in an energy sense of the term. In other words, the analogy I always use is when if you run down the hallway, say, to answer your door, and you have a table with papers on it, you know, the, the wind you stir up could blow some of the papers off the table. You actually aren't throwing the papers on the floor, but the conditions that you create or that are around you will do that. And I... 
the, and the reason I, I started to think of that in 74 was because as we were in that little house in Bridgeport, the tables would flip over. Beds would, but I never felt the presence of an entity when that happened. Maybe that was just me. I felt the presence of entities when things like that were not happening. So my question has always been, is, is are these things creating conditions or the conditions that are allowing them to manifest, as I say, is this what's what's creating the, the, the tricks, at least in some cases? There's a human element that we can't ignore in all of these cases. Humans do project through their thoughts and consciousness, whether mm. they're aware of it or not. And some oh, people yeah. seem to be very good projectors. You know, any sort of... Uh, emotional energy, anger, depression, uh, anxiety can get projected out into the environment and contribute to or perhaps even cause PK effects, psychokinetic effects, which might be mistaken for spirits. Mm -hmm. I think in many cases there is indeed a spirit presence and it's able to uh, plug into that energy and it gets amplified by the human beings. You know, maybe the spirit by itself couldn't do much, uh, but combined with this uh, excitable human energy, it's able to create quite a show. And we, here again, we tend to see a boundary between us and them. And there may be very little boundary, if any at all, in many of these cases. Hmm. One of the things, too, that, I don't know, that seems to come across to me very often, is that when we are experiencing paranormal phenomena, whether it be trickster stuff or not, um, we are, you know, well, you, you know our theories. We're, we're very much into the, uh, the quantum multiverse thing. And <clears throat> in our experience, it seems like we're partially in their world, and they're partially in our world, or at least the worlds are, are partially in each other's world. And that's how a lot of these things happen. And one of the energy issues would be that very often the uh, the laws of physics and many physicists have suggested this who believe it this way the laws of physics are different between two worlds and so and so that's why things float off the ground or there are time slips or things you know seem to disappear and appear and all that and that that's a, a theory that i tend to uh, to be rather sympathetic to what say you uh well i i would agree with that and uh it's it's always seemed to me that the these entities, especially these shape-shifting entities who can come through our walls, our windows, dematerialize, materialize themselves, take things and make them disappear and reappear in other locations, must be using some sort of um, interdimensional physics that we're not familiar with just to, to be able to come through solid matter in, in uh, our universe. We can't do that. So, uh, you know, science tends to look at these things as, uh, well, it's not real, it's imaginary, there must be a natural explanation somewhere. There probably is a natural explanation, it's just outside of what we know. <laughs> exactly. The law of physics. <clears throat> well, as, as several guests have said, I mean, this, this is uh, outside of science, really what, what we're dealing with. <clears throat> Excuse me, yeah. must be the weather these days. Um, w one of the things, too, that's interesting is that... Um, the uh, when I'm, I'm thinking particularly of my own experience in Australia with with uh, my conversations with this uh, Aboriginal elder who um, was talking about this sort of thing, and the trickster came up in the conversation, which was about seven hours long, and <clears throat> he was um, saying that this is associated with animals, uh, but there is a far deeper reality. I mean, the Europeans and Westerners just see this associated with animals as kind of cute, you know, brer rabbit and all that business, but there's a lot more to it. And that the, these are actually there are actually spirits of, of the animals who partake of this reality, so to speak. Um, and Native Americans in this country told Ben the same thing, and have told me the same thing. What about the? I don't know if you're familiar with Freetown State Forest in Massachusetts. Um, it's a lot nearer us than it is you, but uh, the Bridgewater uh, I'm Triangle. Not. I've, uh, I've heard some things about it, but I've never checked into it or investigated there. Well, you're welcome to come with us anytime. We'll, we'll give you the Puckwudgie tour. Um, with, because the Pukwudgie is it's not really a native term, so I'm told, but several um, investigators in the area have, have uh, sort of cited that as, as examples of strange things that happen, very, very, very trickster-like in that particular area, which is uh, centered re really around Brockton and uh, 
Bridgewater, Massachusetts, Mansfield, that area, familiar to all our local listeners here in the Boston Providence area, because uh, it's, uh, it's a big state park. Beautiful area. But some very odd I, things I have happened to us there. I did go into the Hockamock Swamp area looking for puck wedgies once, but never found any. Oh, really? Yeah, well, yeah, well, they don't kind of, you know, like nearby. put their thumbs out and hitch a ride, but they're supposedly <laughs> around. We've had odd things happen, but uh, that sort of thing. Uh, the natives seem very familiar with this, particularly in the West, where coyote is. This, what, 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 do you, what would you say about the, uh, the animal associations of this? Well, I find that interesting that so many tricksters have animal attributes, uh, including physical form, mm-hmm. as well as the characteristics of it. And um, maybe it has to do, uh, here again, with the breaking the laws of nature, something that combines two species that ought not to be combined. That makes them um, out of the bounds of normalcy to begin with. And that seems to be very fundamental to the trickster about breaking the rules. <clears throat> and also, we have, a, <clears throat> we have observed, <clears throat> excuse me, we have observed animals having certain characteristics. And so these characteristics then get grafted onto the trickster as well, like, like the the uh, coyote and the fox. They're cunning and sly, and uh, you know things like that. Well, have you seen any? And this is something that occurred to me in the context of, of looking at this this subject. Was the uh, Egyptian gods with the heads of dogs, or the Assyrian gods with the heads of men and the wings of eagles and the the bodies of be- it, 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 Almost like some sort of vivisections going on here. <laughs> does that have a trickster association, do you think? It does from the standpoint of, again, breaking the rules, that uh, these would be something that would have to be regarded with awe and uh, respect uh, and even even a bit of um, anxiety because it would be not completely human. Um, one of my own theories is that a lot of these entities uh, were jinn because the jinn like to take on forms that are disturbing to human beings and uh, that's part of their trickster nature too hmm. uh, many of them are are very much tricksters and so something that would uh, unsettle or upset people uh, so that you you don't really quite know how to behave what to do to whether or not you should be afraid you should be uh, awestruck um, anything that keeps human beings off balance would be advantageous to a trickster figure. Well, it seems like we do plenty on our own to keep ourselves off balance. But, well, you know, we hear from a lot of Muslims now and then who say, wow, you know, you're describing the jinn. And, and uh, I even had a doctor. And we used to have conversations, you know, all we would love to talk to each other about the jinn. He'd read my last book where I'd bring that up. And he said, my goodness, the, this the whole... Uh, the UFO thing that's going now on now in the Middle East, and a lot of people don't realize there's a UFO flap has been going on in the past few years in the Middle East, and people are reporting all sorts of little even landings and sightings, and they're associating that with the jinn. And um, I just think that's that's really interesting. Um, it's interesting too that the jinn can, or the jinn, or the trickster, I should say, can be either benign or malign, so to speak, can be good or bad. Um, and sometimes they're both. Sometimes and both. Them- doubly uncertain because you never know whether to trust them or distrust them well that's what we always say well you know we're always big on that you know don't trust everything you get from whatever you're getting it from uh, i also sort of don't trust experiences and not entirely that occur before just before just after sleep like when you're still in bed because you know you're how many times i don't know if this happens to you but i wake up sometimes you know in the morning and I'll hear a voice right in my ear or I'll hear something happening and it'll be, uh, sometimes it'll be significant because it'll be, you know, Ben wanted to talk to me or somebody in the family was, you know, was, or even the, even the cat. Uh, my wife was on the second floor of our house and we have a very strange and interesting cat. You'd love to meet him. And he's, <laughs> um, sort of a trickster in his own right. But she was on the second floor of our house. It was the middle of the winter. Everything was closed, the windows, and she heard him down on the sidewalk. I yeah, wanted to come in, and and he, and he can he's got a speech impediment. He can barely I'm not going to say talk, but you know he can barely. Uh, he sounds like he's a rusty gate. He doesn't mew, and uh, she thought that was very interesting. And she's not into this stuff at all. So there are all sorts of things associated with animals that are interesting and UFOs. But uh, I'm looking too at your notes here that you sent as well. But is is there a purpose 
to the trickster? I mean, we look for logic answers, beginning, middle, end, and all that. Is there a purpose to this? None that we can make sense out of. Um, well, I might I have think one you just suggestion. Nail on the head by saying, you know, we're we always look for something logical. We want an explanation that makes sense. We're logic oriented and in, in searching for answers and, and meanings to things. And with the paranormal and with tricksters, as as we see them in mythology, uh, sometimes there aren't any answers. Things don't make sense, and that's just the way it is. Yeah, that's true. And so maybe, uh, in a, from a mythology perspective, one of the purposes of trickster is to just get you to think outside the box. Uh, and sometimes the joke is played on you in the process. <laughs> With the paranormal, yes. uh, it's it's really mystifying. I mean, sometimes, uh, as you've noticed in these haunting cases, uh, there seems to be something that is very aggressive and has the intention of of harming people. And other times, it, it's difficult to know exactly what the purpose is. Uh, these uh, poltergeist cases where the uh, crazy phenomena just goes round and around. And another thing that we see in, in both ufology and paranormal are spiraling intensities where there can be a wave of activity, and it gets more and more intense, and there's more phenomena, and more people get caught up in, in the whole uh, scenario, and then um, all of a sudden it just stops. It's like almost like an exploding cigar. It's like, boom, it's mm. over. Yep. And um, you, you have to wonder, well, here again, what, what was that all about? You know, why did all of that happen? Mm. Or we have cases, and John Keel talked about this in his work, um, he addressed the trickster um, a number of times in, in his books that a researcher could be tracking something and you get more and more information and you think you're getting somewhere, you're thinking uh, you're going to get answers or you're going to you know, really meet the aliens and prove once, for, and once and for all that they're real, uh, something like that, and then, again, it just suddenly evaporates. Mm-hmm. Uh, so you're almost like the dog by chasing your tail, you know, exactly, you yeah. around and around in circles until suddenly it stops. Mm-hmm. This is a pattern to trickster that we see in the paranormal over and over and over again. Yeah, it's true. Well, we're going to take a quick break, folks, and you're listening to Behind the Paranormal with this evening with Paul Eno and Rosemary Ellen Guiley on W O O N twelve forty a.m. Stick with us; we'll be right back. Hi. I'm Russ Gorman. If you're concerned about 2013, relax. It's actually the 14th year of the 21st century and a great time to get an astrological chart done. This year, I'm offering an added feature. I'm including lucky numbers on request with each chart or update at no extra fee. Discover what tomorrow will bring in regard to money, health, job, relationships, or possible windfalls. Call me at 401-333-4048 for information on getting your individual chart or update. Give your life a fresh start. Welcome the changes the planets are providing. I'm also available for private parties and speaking engagements for groups. Look forward to enjoying your future this year. Call me, Russ Gorman, at 401-333-4048. And hello again. It's Behind the Paranormal with uh, this evening with Paul Eno and Rosemary Ellen Guiley filling in for Ben Eno. And uh, we're talking about the trickster this evening, a uh, motif in human folklore and cultures all over the world. And uh, I, I, I don't know, I might have a possible explanation here, Rosemary, and see what you think about it. And again, you know our theories, which are a little bit off the beaten path when mo- concerning most paranormal researchers and approaches. Now, I believe... Um, there are about nine different species of what we refer to as these parasites, uh, what are commonly known as demonic entities and this, this sort of thing. However, I, uh, per, uh, despite my seminary background, I came out of there sort of realizing, well, I don't think that's quite good enough to explain what these things are doing. And um, I rank these creatures, and I've actually had physical, I don't think they're spirits necessarily, or whatever that may mean in, in, in other realms, um, they, I rank them by their apparent intelligence, experience, power, and vulnerability. 
and it's possible that some of them could be younger or older individuals of the same species with their maturity making a difference in my interpretation. But to me, each group does seem to be unique unto itself. Now, I have every reason to believe that parasites do not all come from the same world, if we're talking about parallel worlds, though they do seem to interact with each other, sometimes in a hostile manner. There's even a species that I refer to as the tricksters. And uh, if any species in the multiverse, if there is one, can be intellectual lightweights but clever at the same time, it must be these guys. And I have them about second from the bottom uh, in the ranking of these, these beings. Uh, they, they get energy uh, flowing from their victims through startling pranks and unpleasant surprises. And as with all parasites, their abilities to travel among these parallel worlds will make it seem as though they can mani manipulate space and time something that, as our friend H.P. Lovecraft pointed out, in itself will strike terror into the human heart and uh, probably pump out more energy. Now, I, I even think the tricksters are often the origins of the you know, enlightened masters, uh, space brothers, some, some of the aliens and false spirit guys, and all this stuff that have a field day among gullible people. What say you on that? Uh, th that, that to me personally, has been the only logical explanation, if there is a logical explanation, uh, for, for some of these trickster phenomena or these, these parasitical entities trying to eat. I've always felt that spirits use us as feeding grounds, and uh, they get energy off of us by evoking emotions from us. Like these shadow people figures, they evoke in us a lot of fear, and it's a very quick visceral, instinctive kind of fear, and that's a, a tremendous rush of energy, and I believe that that's what they really want. They want the energy, and then, who knows, they might even be amused at our response. That might be part of it, too. Yeah, possibly. But, uh, they do. They, they feed off human emotion and thought, and so some of this, as, as you point out, may be engineered specifically to get the food they want. Mm-hmm. Well, there's even a lower branch and I refer to as the the brats. <laughs> the brats, and then the next branch is the tricksters. The brats seem to be the lowest echelon. They, they they act like they they seem to do similar things, but they really act like spoiled and it sometimes frightened children. Because I find that that many of them are, especially the lower ones, are are frightened too. Uh, what I especially find is that they, they the longer they spend. Um, messing with us or in our world or partially in it or whatever you want to call it, the more they forget their own origins. And I've actually, I, I've been working for, uh, with several people, including a, a well-known artist in New York City who's been on the show in, the, with a disguised voice, uh, who has been bothered by one of these things for 25 years or more. And this thing tries to push her downstairs and does all these strange things and will actually argue with her. She can hear a voice. Uh, and it's, it, it acts like a child. It, it's frightened. It, it doesn't want to, to, um, to separate from the host, which is her, because it, it has been with her so long. It doesn't remember where it came from, doesn't know where to go, and it's terrified. And yet it will do all the, these, these trickster-like things. Um, I don't know if you've run into that, but it just, th that's one of the things that, that gives me, uh, sort of arrows in the quiver for this particular theory about these things feeding. They do, and I do run into cases of entity attachment. These these entities become attached to people. Uh, oftentimes, they will masquerade as a deceased human spirit. Exactly. Yeah. To to seem harmless and gain sympathy, and enable them to strengthen their link to someone, and uh, they can become uh, quite accustomed to uh, going around with a person and. Uh, they they feed off that person's life, the emotions, and they don't want to go. You often have to get exorcisms performed on these people uh, if they decide that they want to get rid of this. But I also see, and you probably have too, Paul, that people get attached to these entities, especially if they're fooled into thinking that they're friendly and benign, uh, and they don't want them to go. They, oh, they develop to relationships a vacuum with them. in their yeah. life. I had a case in 1998. The woman, it was not far from here. It was right in our listening area. The woman was, uh, and it was a classic situation. She was unemployed, depressed, hardly ever left this house. Um, you know, a very bad situation. And, and th this is, this is, rings the dinner bell, in my opinion, if you're, you have the, the other ducks that are lined up as well. 
she developed a relation. She bonded with this thing. And I walked into the house, I could feel it right away, but she thought this was a, a lover from a former life. And th- that's what it convinced her she was. And of course, you know, I, I you know, the circumstances were all wrong for any kind of situation like that. And uh, I actually had someone sit with her uh, at night and she would, she got up and she would scream and she actually had hand marks on her neck. As if something was trying to strangle her. I mean, you know the scenario. You've seen it all too. So I mean, this. But it just it when you see when you have their number and they know you have their number, it really gets interesting because that's when I find it's best to deal with them. Now, in this particular case, I recommended that the woman move, and she did. And everything happened to work out for her. She, she married a native elder. Which didn't hurt because he had he knew about this stuff too, and everything's been fine ever since, as far as I know. So, um, how do you approach a case in your own work where you feel you're dealing with one of these things? Well, you know, a trickster will say, and um, some they bonded with someone. If if it seems that the human being has an emotional attachment to this entity, it's very difficult to get them to change if they don't want to. Uh, if they have to be really ready to release this entity. And uh, sometimes uh, I'll be called in on a case where uh, that seems to be the scenario and the person is expecting something else, expecting some other kind of answer or explanation. Oh, yes. yep. And uh, usually the reaction is one of denial. It's, uh, oh, no, I'm not, uh, I'm, I'm not attached to something, you know. Mm-hmm. I have a spirit guide, but... Uh, he or she is really friendly. This is not the same thing that's going on. They don't want to recognize the situation for what it is. And, uh, Paul, I've just found that there's not much you can do uh, but um, just provide the information and your analysis and assessment. And uh, if they're not ready to, to release something, there's nothing you can do about it. No, it's true. Well, there there are several layers to that problem. I've gone into cases, and I'm sure you have too, where people have already decided what the problem is. You know, uh, I'm thinking of the one in Yonkers, New York, in 1975 that I often I was still in the seminary at the time. And matter of fact, I remember the scenario. I was uh, we used to go out to parishes in the New York area to help out on the weekends, and uh, I, I saw one of my classmates uh, pointing to me, and a woman came running over and said, "Oh." Uh, you know, he say, he says you know about ghosts. And I was trying to keep this quiet because I was in enough trouble as it was with the seminary authorities. And um, so I kind of gave the eye to my classmate there, and he kind of snickered. But it ended up in one of the most interesting cases that I've ever dealt with. And it was, um, again, something that, that turned out, in my opinion, to be not what it appeared to be. It wasn't a trickster, I think. Uh, but it, it was kind of an interesting it – was, it was a guy apparently transitioning from one life to another. It was really interesting, and if it was what it appeared to be. Or it could have been a trickster. You know, it could have been something pretending. And, and you, uh, you like to think uh, that, that you have the experience to tell the difference. But you can always be fooled, and I'm always aware of that. Sometimes I've had to change my mind about something uh, in, in terms of what's really going on. I've had to reevaluate my beliefs about ghosts a number of times in terms of uh, what I've experienced in the field. And I tell people, uh, you know, people will say, well, what is this? What, what entity is this? And why is this happening? And oftentimes I will tell people that, you know, it takes time to investigate something. You have to find out a lot about it. But even then, you may only be making your best guess ass- assessment. Uh, there may be no conclusive hard proof uh, evidence of something one way or the other. And I think that's the way it is in, in paranormal in general. We, we give it our best assessment, which is why throughout history we have applied so many different names and terms to what I feel are really the same entities. I think you're right, because we, our minds, we make it fit. We're, we're sort of, we're the kind of creatures that we, we have to have, as we said, we have to have our answers. We have to have the beginning and the end. We have to have everything else you pigeonhole, particularly in the Western mind. And we often do that. Well, I'm going to pause for just a second here, Rosemary, to give you a chance, to, because we're, we're, we're going to be yakking here. We'll get to the end of the hour and burn it up. Tell people about your books. You've written, I don't know, a lot more books than I have. A tremendous, <laughs> tremendously prolific author. Very well-known name in the, in the field, and uh, you make a lot of public appearances. Uh, tell us about your books, where people can get them, your website, and what's going on. 
My website is visionaryliving.com, and I also have an entire website on the gin, ginuniverse.com, and that's D-J-I-N-N universe.com. I just have, uh, actually I have two new books out, and one is called The Gin Connection. Hmm. It mentioned a little earlier uh, about, um, you know, Muslims pointing out that a lot of this UFO activity, you know, describes the jinn. Well, the, this book deals with the connection. The, the subtitle of it is The Hidden Links Between uh, the Jinn, Shadow People, ETs, Nephilim, Archons, Reptilians, and Other Entities. And um, other entities, I sort of ran out of space on the cover, <laughs> uh, fairies, men in black, you know. I, I reevaluate the ancient gods and goddesses like the Watchers, the Anunnaki, uh, the, and, you know, the, the Nephilim, e- Egyptian, you know, hybrids, uh, from the standpoint of jinn. I think the, the jinn are one of our major players. They're not the only player, but they're one of our major players in the paranormal, and they're, they do a very good job at staying hidden, and there is an intense trickster element to them. Then uh, I also have out an, a new book on dreams called The Pocket uh, Guide to a uh, pocket dream guide and dictionary, and it's about how to interpret your dreams and and um, make sense out of them, both from a personal and a spiritual perspective. This coming weekend, I'm going to be at the Victory of Light Festival in Cincinnati. It's a wonderful event, and uh, I'll be doing uh, some readings and a fairy workshop in Medina. After that, uh, I've got uh, workshops and conferences lined up throughout the summer. And on into the fall, and uh, the details about them are on my calendar page on my website. That's good. I, uh, I could, I've never been able to keep up with this lady. It's, but check <laughs> out those sites. And, and there aren't too many people we endorse. Uh, ben and I are very skeptical about just about everybody in this field. But you stick with Rosemary, and you can't go wrong. I think that's uh, easy, you know, very, uh, very justified to say that. Well, getting back to the, the dear old trickster here, um, the uh, the issue, there are two issues that, that have come up in my mind, two cases that are very well known. Uh, one is the Mothman situation in, in West Virginia. For those who don't know, in the 1960s, uh, the so-called Mothman, as the press dubbed it, appeared in West Virginia and there were uh, and, and in the Ohio Valley in general. Uh, this this was a creature that uh, most descriptions uh, talk about it as being very dark and, as Rosemary was describing, uh, sort of exuding a feeling of fear. Uh, or, or creating a f- tremendous feeling of fear. I talked to people down there who were kids at the time and heard footsteps on their roofs, red eyes looking in the window. Uh, the red eyes were classic, um, sort of no head and, and huge wings that would fly and, and chase cars at 100 miles an hour and all this sort of thing. You name it, it did it. But that was part of, uh, and a lot of people don't realize this, that was not an isolated phenomenon. That was part of a flap, as we call it. There were UFOs. Uh, ghost activity, particularly poltergeists, all sorts of stuff, men in black, and you name it. How Would you uh, consider that uh, sort of a, a uh, I suppose, a landmark trickster manifestation, the Mothman phenomenon, or is it, is it that simple? It certainly was. In fact, it's an excellent case of paranormal and UFO trickster at work. Mothman was uh, a trickster figure, uh, actually, Mothman acted in, in almost comical kinds of ways. This was not a, an aggressive, hostile creature, even though it looked terrifying. And it acted in weird ways, defied natural laws. It could fly without flapping its wings. It could rise straight up in the air like a helicopter. It could be here one minute and, and there the next. Uh, so it seemed to teleport itself around. But it acted very curious about people. And uh, when it was chasing cars, uh, the, the first victims who saw it, you know, it, it um, chased their car at close to 100 miles an hour. It was almost like, hey, what's this? It's a <laughs> weird-looking contraption with, you know, beings in it. And uh, it was almost like it, it wanted to find out. It would look in windows at, at people. Mm. And so... Yeah, it, I talked to people that looked at and and some people said, you know, it almost seemed lost, like it fell through an interdimensional doorway and was wandering around wondering where on earth it was. Mm-hmm. Oh, so exactly. It, it had had the elements of, of both kind of comic appearance and behavior uh, combined with the 
uh, the terror bringing, you know, it absolutely inspired, inspired terror. Then we had all this other stuff, poltergeist phenomena that made absolutely no sense at all. Men in black, they're trickster figures. Mm-hmm. They look bizarre, act bizarre, and yet they they show up and, and threaten people, and they know, seem to know a lot about people who've had UFO experiences. They don't seem to be quite real. Um, missing things, there were uh, odd things happening, like uh, John Keel, when he went down to West Virginia to investigate, he writes in his book, The Mothman Prophecy, prophecies that he stopped at a motel for the night, just pulled off the road, no reservation, no nothing, checks in, and the clerk says, oh, there's a message for you, and hands him a message that someone had called and left a message. And, of course, it was, you know, a nonsensical sort of thing. People would get phone calls and uh, hear just uh, gibberish on the other end. People would get phone calls from um, weird voices that said they were aliens and uh, all kinds of crazy things happened and then mm-hmm. it suddenly stopped yeah and i should point out that john keel was a professional journalist i believe he was with the new york herald and the new york world he was yeah and he uh, that's why he was down there investigating this and he got caught up in it well th- that's that happened to me just last week um as you know everybody we're involved ben and i are involved in this rendlesham case maybe the next chapter of it uh because we're on we're, we're deliberately trying to uncover um witnesses beyond the ufo witnesses of this december 1980 incidents and we were just over there and we were uh, encountering all sorts of local people who had all these these things they've never talked about that occurred in that area it's a very powerful place and uh my cell phone rang one morning and it was um Someone whom one of our contacts there is someone who's been a guest on the show, Brenda Butler, uh, one of the local authors on this, and the, probably the first civilian investigator of it. And uh, I, I didn't even know she had my phone number, so I called her back. And of course, five hour time difference. She had just gotten home from work and said, "I didn't call you," and she'd never called me before. She's a very untechnical person; doesn't even have email. Well, she well, she, no, she, she does have email, but I mean, just but not uh, you know, she's not uh, technologically uh, adept person. And she uh, never called me, she said. And there, and uh, the caller ID said Brenda Butler, and then I looked again, and it said unknown, but it was the same number. So, you know, this is the sort of thing that does happen, funny things with space and time, a strange electrical phenomena particularly, and that was evident in the, in the Mothman case. They, so, they really love to play with uh, telephones and appliances, anything electrical. Always electrical, yeah. Well, very vulnerable to the poltergeist. Effect. Well, I don't know if I ever told you this, but one of the funny things that happened to us a number of years ago was uh, we have a, a relatively big house here in, in uh, Woonsocket, and uh, one of the benefits I always felt of being a paranormal investigator is that you don't expect your own house to be haunted, right? That's right. And uh, I walked. I, I, I walked, there were shaking bed incidents which are pretty common, commonly reported. And I happened to walk out onto the landing outside our bedroom one night, and there, there was uh, th- this amazing electrical feeling that I often get, and a lot of the people report, when there's the presence of an entity or something weird going on at least. And I said, whoa, wait a minute, what's going on here? So uh, there were a night or two of this, and I used my own advice that you, uh, I'm sure, would agree with, and don't assume it's paranormal. What you do is, uh, you know, te- Run all the the common tests. You know, is it anything else? Is it uh, something else causing this? And sure enough, I took the um, the dear old EMF meter, electromagnetic field meter, which I rarely use because I'm not into gadgets. And it led me right to the 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 air pump on my older son's aquarium. That thing was pumping out 2,000 milligauss. And it would, that's high enough to cause a health hazard. So we get rid of the pump, all phenomena ceased immediately. And all I could think of was the infrasound phenomenon where the, you know, the, the standing waves get stuck and people start to see and hear things. And the question is, uh, was the, this, I don't know, I wonder how much of this might be responsible. Is it, and then there's another question, do these standing waves, if that's what it was, create the illusion of paranormal phenomena or do they open doors? Do they create the conditions we talked about earlier? For these these phenomena to occur, in, in in my terms, do they do they blend? You know, they, they do funny things with space and time, make worlds blend, and all this sort of thing. So, the, the more you look into this, the more possible explanations they are, and the less sense it can make. 
In fact, it becomes a trickster thing in and of itself. It does, you just yes. start, um, you know, your mind gets twisted in so many ways that uh, after a while you don't know what's up and what's down. That's true. Well, you know, another thing it brings up, Rosemary, is the, is the tulpa phenomenon. And for those who don't know, a, a tulpa is generally thought of as a thought form that is created, and it's big and it was big in, in Tibetan mysticism, Tibetan Buddhist mysticism, and monks would uh, discipline their minds and uh, by by attempting to create a a spirit or a being of some kind, and if they were really good at it, the thing would do stuff for them. And but of course, but more often than not, it would get out of hand, and it couldn't be controlled, and that sort of thing. And, and that that's got parasite written all over it. And I think rather than creating it, they might have been just ringing the dinner bell. Uh, whether that's correct, I don't know, but I suspect that might be the case. <laughs> so, I mean, what, uh, how could, could the, and we're thinking of, uh, we were talking earlier about people projecting. Is it possible that people might create, uh, tulpa or trickster like even entities or, or phenomena of that? Have you ever suspected that? I have indeed, Paul, uh, and I did study the whole thing, or I have rather, it's an ongoing thing about thought forms and tulpas that if we have a powerful enough projection of consciousness, we can literally give something form and energize it. And uh, with the tulpa, these these are ritually created, and they're intended to be animated and to do things and be under someone's control, almost like a familiar sort of spirit. Uh, And I loved Alexandra David Neal's description. Uh, You know, she was that... uh, famous woman explorer who, who spent such a long time in Tibet, and uh, she created a tulpa that uh, she wanted an assistant for, for a trip, and he was a nice, young, shiny, looked like a, a youth. Uh, yeah, sometimes and, they can be photographed. Uh, yes, sometimes they can, but over the course of time, it started getting out of control and taking on its own form. It got uglier and meaner and, and started uh, doing nasty things, and she had to figure out how to get rid of it which uh, these things seem to be able to take on uh, some measure of independence. Uh, so that's, that's a hazard with the thought form. Yeah. But getting back to, you know, is it, is it spirit or, or is it thought form, it, it could very well be that we are often dealing with hybrids of these things. Mm, interesting. But um, there may be energy that gets pulled from us unconsciously uh, and gets wrapped into something that's from the, the spirit realms and becomes an entirely different sort of entity. Well, that gets into our philosophy, I guess, that I express in my last book, Turning Home, that we are really ultimately part of what we call the unity. It's kind of like the African notion of Ubuntu. We are not only attached to each other, we are part of each other quite concretely. And that when we deal with these things, we're really dealing with a part of ourselves, even if it is an independent entity, the consciousness is indiscriminate and shared. Uh, so the, I don't know. So if, if that uh, accounts for anything, I don't know. But we, well, before we, we, we're almost done here, but I just wanted to mention the Mothman thing. Uh, there is, there was one person we had on the show who had a positive Mothman experience. He said that he was just a kid and his whole family encountered Mothman. And they were all terrified, but he himself suddenly experienced a renaissance within himself. He became, uh, he, his marks went up, he became sort of a math genius, and he's, he ended up a brilliant photographer and artist, which is something he loves, and he does it today. So he, he sort of attributes that to Mothman. So maybe the experience of the trickster is very personal. It depends on what we're, uh, what, what we're dealing with here. But Rosemary, we're out of time. Thank you so much. It's always a great pleasure, and it's a lot of fun to talk to you, and uh, we'll be in touch off the air. It's been a great evening with you, Paul. Thank you so much. Very good. Thanks again, and uh, we'll talk to you soon. Okay, everybody, Rosemary Ellen Guiley. Um, check her out uh, to the uh, Internet. She's a, she's a tremendous person who uh, is uh, very well thought of in the field and uh, one of the major names. Uh, okay, so let's uh, do our uh, wrap it up here anyway. Uh, we have our website, BehindTheParanormal.com, and you can find all sorts of information on guests and uh, upcoming shows, things of that kind, and 450, at least, free podcasts that are available. You can also buy my books, subscribe to our newsletter, and uh, sort of find out what's going on generally with the show, what Ben and I are up to, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, again, uh, many thanks to our producer this evening, who have been, been Denise and uh, Dave Richards.
And on our April 8th show next week, we will welcome author, artist, and photographer Jason Dowd to talk about his lifelong battle with the paranormal. Has not had a good experience with those phenomena. On our CBS radio edition on April 7th in Boston, Pittsburgh, Detroit, and Seattle, and on Radio.com, we'll welcome British folklorist, author, and psychic Cassandra Eason. Meanwhile, send your questions and comments to us at Paul at or Ben at BehindTheParanormal.com or write a good old-fashioned letter to us at Behind the Paranormal Radio, care of WON, 1240 AM, 985 Park Avenue, Winsocket, RI, 02895. And that's it. We'll talk to you next week. Return to this radio frequency 167 hours from now for another edition of Behind the Paranormal with Paul and Ben Eno.